Glorious Geeks! Are any of you following this ridiculousness with Gorilla Glue? I swear I try to avoid stupid news, but when you're a news junkie, there's no way around it. Someone explain to me why there's a challenge now with people putting this stuff in their hair, even though it's literally sending people to the hospital. I mean, people in Texas have no heat or water, and yet the rest of the country is wondering if they can put this shit in their hair. For those of you out there considering this, please don't do it. Okay, let's get to the important stuff, but before we start, please do me a favor and hit that subscribe button below and like this video. Looky, looky who's starting to change their behavior now that they know the bad cops in town. You geeks know I spend a lot of time ranting about Saudi Arabia's horrific human rights abuses, but the Crown Prince, also known as MBS, which stands for Mohammed Baby Salman, is making some interesting moves to try and get in President Biden's good graces. Over the last few weeks, he released three activists from prison, including women's rights activist Lujain Al Hathloul, who I previously put on my crush list because she's awesome. Lujain fought for the women's right to drive in Saudi Arabia, and she was released even though she refused to bend to the Saudi government's demand that she claimed she wasn't tortured. There are still many imprisoned activists in Saudi Arabia, including other women's rights activists. But still, could these be small steps in the right direction? The Crown Prince Baby also announced some judicial reforms in the last few weeks that basically should prevent judges from doing whatever they want, which is important because their ability to <clears throat> interpret the law has really hurt women in Saudi Arabia. Geeks, it's no coincidence this has all happened since Inauguration Day. Repeat after me, what happens here in the United States matters a lot abroad. So it's no surprise that the Crown Prince Baby might be changing his ways now that he sees a different sheriff in town. For a while now, President Biden and Vice President Harris have said that they would be recalibrating the relationship with Saudi Arabia. So what they're saying is, hey, we've been treating Saudi Arabia with this special relationship for years, and we've been ignoring their human rights abuses, and basically condoning, if not aiding, their behavior in Yemen. So no, we're not going to do that anymore. So as soon as Biden got to office, he put a pause on arms sales to the Saudis and said he would try to help end the Saudi-led war in Yemen. He's also promised to focus on improving Saudi's horrific human rights track record. And our badass director of national intelligence, Avril Haines, said she'd release a CIA report about the killing of Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi, which we know says the Crown Prince knew about the murder. Now, the White House press secretary this week said that President Biden wasn't going to deal with the Crown Prince baby, but with Biden's direct counterpart instead, who would be the baby's dad, King Salman. And since I used to work in government, let me decode that for you. That's Biden's way of saying, we're not going to deal with you because we think you're a thug. It's good because it's not like Biden is throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I couldn't resist. So the Crown Prince knows he's being watched and that he's on a short leash. I've always thought we needed to normalize the relationship with Saudi Arabia, so I'm hoping that by letting the Saudi government know we're disappointed and what the U.S. won't stand for, their behavior will improve. You geeks, do you have any idea how close Haiti is to the United States? It's 800 miles off the coast of Florida. Like I could swim that. I mean, I can't, but I'm sure Michael Phelps could. And yet the news here is barely covering what's going on there. I asked you all if you had any idea and 83% of you said no. Thousands have been protesting across Haiti, calling for their president to leave office, and many of these protesters clashed with the police. So let me break down for you what's going on and why it matters. Presidents in Haiti serve five-year terms, and this guy was elected five years ago, but the elections were disputed, the results canceled, and to make a long story short, he ended up taking office a year later than expected. So he claims he's got another year left, and the US and UN agree with that, but a lot of Haitians don't, and they say he should have stepped down on February 7th. So on February 7th hit, the president claimed there was an attempted coup and he arrested a bunch of people he claims were involved. So citizens have hit the streets. Now the reason this president is hated by many is because he's super corrupt, because crime in Haiti, things like kidnapping and gang violence have skyrocketed, and because dude doesn't know how to improve the economy there for a country where 60% of the people live in poverty. There are also claims of possible embezzlement from a program where Venezuela loaned Haiti oil, which then Haiti could sell to help fund social and economic programs there. Except somehow $2 billion has gone missing. Most importantly, he has a little whiff of dictator on him. Or maybe a lot. Legislative elections there have been suspended for the past two years, so he's ruling by decree. And he's pursuing a constitutional referendum this year that people fear will expand his authorities and allow him to keep running for office. There are two reasons you should care about what happens in Haiti. First and foremost, because when countries that are near us face poverty, crime, or general turmoil, it can result in mass migration to the United States, which could cause a refugee crisis here. Second, if that happens, it's going to cost the United States even more, not just because of migrants, but because we'll likely end up paying to fix the whole place. So helping get at the root of these problems is important. I feel like this is one of those aha moments that never actually happens in Washington. Now, Biden criticized Trump for not doing enough to help Haiti. In fact, if you all remember, Trump called it a whole country. And for now, Biden said he supports the president, assuming he arranges free and fair elections this year. That's fine. It could have been a stronger statement, but they're going to have to keep a close eye on this dude because he isn't exactly known for upholding democracy. And if we appear like we don't really care about his authoritarian tendencies, then it could just make things worse. <laughs> you 
guys won't believe this story. I have like real world rage over this. As you all probably remember, a mass explosion, one of the most powerful in history, happened in Beirut last summer thanks to nearly 3,000 tons of ammonium nitrate the incompetent government left sitting in a port. In a matter of seconds, over 200 people died and thousands were injured because of this blast, which also left hundreds of thousands of people homeless or displaced. A lot of these people were already financially struggling since the country's economy is in a horrific state. So now imagine you have no money and now you have no home. So the Lebanese did what the Lebanese do and they ran in there to help rebuild homes, provide food and medical aid. But not the Lebanese government. Rather than help these victims, they're now working to make a profit off of them by requiring people who receive donations to pay tax on them. Shut the world up. Aside from the fact that this is practically criminal, a move like that could prevent people from donating at all. This defies all logic. So I decided to do what I love to do when no one's paying attention to a pending disaster, and I've summarized the situation in Lebanon in rhyme. <laughs> Lebanon is struggling, it's been so abysmal. The economy's in the shitter and the outlook is dismal. It started when the people protested en masse against a government that didn't know its head from its ass. The economy blew up and inflation's on the rise. People want their cash, but the government steals and it lies. While COVID cases keep going up and poverty, pollution, and famine won't stop. A mass explosion at the port took everything away. Thousands injured and 200 dead in one day. The government's so incompetent you want to tear out your hair. They're killing their people, it's just too much to bear. Hezbollah's a problem, they're the worst of the worst. They hold the country hostage, they care about Iran first. And corrupt leaders and warlords need to meet their fate. They are the leeches sucking on the state. Now they're taxing donations, what's that all about? They won't stop being criminals till they've cleaned people out. The youth need to rise up and get in the game. Think only about the flag, not religion or names. Some new faces, new elections, it would be a good start. The world needs to help before it all falls apart. Geeks, I don't think we understand how many women abroad and in the United States are subjected to female genital mutilation and what it means that this horrific abuse takes place. Female genital mutilation, or FGM, is the partial or total cutting and injuring of the external female genitalia for non-medical reasons and it's a violation of women's rights. Around 200 million women and girls around the world are FGM survivors. 200 million! And the CDC says that over half a million girls and women have either undergone this practice or at risk of it here in the United States. Let that sink in. Like some of them might be your friends and you have no idea. Well, one of them is my friend, Mariam Safi. And after she bravely and publicly shared her story, she's been crushing it by working to end this abuse globally through policy and by shifting the culture and the way we talk about it. She also just published a pretty mind-blowing piece with the Council on Foreign Relations where she argues that while pushing survivors to speak out can help, the responsibility to bring an end to this torture cannot rest alone on their shoulders. So I brought Miriam on the show so she could explain why fighting to end FGM is so important and why you should care. She's a gender equality advocate, a fellow SEPA alum, and also a foreign service officer with the U.S. State Department, but she spoke to me in her personal capacity. Hey Miriam, it is so great to see you. Thanks for joining the show. Thanks for having me. It's such an honor to be here. Oh, thank you. So listen, you are in this amazing fight to end this practice. Can you tell everybody why is this fight so important to end female genital mutilation and why should people care about it? So ending FGM is important because it affects 200 million women and girls and all girls have the right to live, you know, in safety, free of violence and have the right to, you know, be whole and have carefree childhood. And so it's not just the ethically right thing to do, it's also economically smart. Uh, the World Health Organization estimates $1.4 billion lost um, as a result of FGM. So it's both the right and the smart thing to do. So it's an economic issue as well. Um, it's an so economic issue and a human, it's a human rights issue with a hefty price tag. Amazing. And so do you sense that things are getting better? So for example, I saw that last year Sudan banned FGM and Egypt yep. has tried to toughen laws. Do you sense that there's this cultural shift or is there a lot of work left to do? I think it's both. I think as more survivors start sharing their stories and break, breaking the culture of silence, you're starting to see communities shift in terms of uh, the practice. In my own community, I was one of the few first to share my own story as a survivor. And now I've seen a snowball effect of so many more speaking out, both survivors and uh, allies and male, and, and particularly men, actually, brothers and fathers and husbands. So I think, you know, we can't put all of the burden on survivors to, to tell their stories. It, it's a lot of work. It's triggering. It can be traumatizing. And it's also, um, you know, it, it's, it needs to be the a whole of society approach. Many survivors face backlash, they face from within their communities, from within their own families. So uh, we need everyone, everyone needs to be involved in the fight to end FGM. 
and that includes policymakers. I agree with you. Well, thank you, Miriam, for speaking out about this and for your bravery. And I am really hopeful that the culture on this will change. Thank you. Thank you for having me. February 6th was the International Day of Zero Tolerance for Female Genital Mutilation. And I'm hoping that after watching this, you read Miriam's powerful pieces, which I'll link to. If you want to join me, please call for an end to this abuse with the hashtag EndFGM. Geeks, you guys are the best. I have so much fun doing this. I'm kind of thinking of featuring you all on my show. Like, do you aspire to be an Oh My World correspondent? More details on that soon. Please do me a favor in the meantime and hit that subscribe button, leave me a comment or question, and please follow Oh My World and me on Instagram and Twitter. Stay fabulous, geeks.